Hey everyone, welcome to chapter 15 in the cardiorespiratory fitness training chapter. So again, kind of bouncing off of the last few chapters we've gone over, chapter 13 was the integrated model that's going to show you all types of styles of training that you're going to fit into your exercise programming. Chapter That was chapter 13. Chapter 14 is the flexibility chapter that will get you to the first point. And now the second point in your exercise programming or it's its own separate entity, depending upon how you're gonna use it, would be cardio, all right? So there's your learning objectives down there on the bottom, okay? So, you know, cardiorespiratory fitness, you know, what is the whole purpose here is for the heart and blood vessels and the blood and the circulatory system and the respiratory system of your lungs, the alveoli, your airway, all to be able to provide oxygen during activity so that you can have you know, basically, I'm a, you know, metabolic reactions within your system to be able to use oxygen to be able to break down your carbs, fats, and proteins to be able to sustain, you know, some, you know, some sort of movement or at rest. Okay. But for our sake here, we're talking about, you know, true cardio. So we're going to not talk about rest. We're going to talk about in motion. So it is one of the five components of what we would call health related physical fitness, muscles, muscle strength, cardio, flexibility, body composition, flexibility, um, yeah, flexibility, body composition, cardio, muscular strength, and power, okay? So all of those are part of that whole process. So again, with the components of health-related physical fitness, this is one of the main ones. It doesn't mean it's the most important one, but it means that it is a very important piece to obtaining a healthy lifestyle or a health related fitness level. All right. Um, again, you know, cardio is very big on active, you know, making it easier to do activities of daily living. Um, we are not, you know, one of the things that happens with cardio though is, uh, you know, they talk about rate of progression, how fast people proceed and move on with everything. The, most people, you know, I shouldn't say people, most trainers are, are, are sometimes fall victim to giving people too much of a dose within that, you know, frequency, intensity, time, and type, the part of the fit VP principle, you know, they're trying to give them too much too soon, and that really can become challenging. So we have to be aware that, you know, you can't just give somebody, oh, go run two miles today. You know, you got you to be very aware of where they were. So that's why the assessment piece is always very important. All right. And then moving people too fast through cardio, you know, cardio fitness, it, it's it's really about, um, you know, th they're going to basically either get injured too soon, you're going to progress them too quick, and it's going to create, um, you know, a bad situation where, um, you know, they'll, they'll start to become um, overloaded too much, and their adherence will, will be down. And so they'll, prog they'll progress too slow, and it'll just become a challenge. So, you know, you have to be very aware of what you're programming them in, in the right way, in the right stage, in the right manner. All right. As far as benefits go, there's so many that, you know, are, are there health related wise. There are, you know, skill related wise, you know, again, it's not so much skill because the skill related is more about like agility, balance and coordination, things like that. So we're talking more about the health related components. So moderate intensity, 150 you know, minutes or more per week, a vigorous amount, 75 or more per week or a combination of everything. All right. So we look at it from that standpoint where you know, we want to make sure that we're giving the right dosage within the, either separately or in a combination so that we can be, you know, you know, on top of, you know, what benefits we're going to get from them. So, um, you know, your fitness level, your cardio fitness level is a very strong predictor for morbidity and mortality, you know, things that will promote, you know, death. All right. Um, also health, longevity, weight loss. So you're talking about body composition. All right. You know, talking about what we're looking for there. Um, sedentary individuals may experience rapid deteriorations in their overall health and well-being. That said, what you know, what the main focus of that is, is that if you stop, or if you if you're a person who trained, exercised, and then stopped and went, you know, you're going to have that reversal. We're talking here about people who are specifically don't move. You know, sedentary people who don't do anything, you know, exercise-wise throughout their life. So overall health and well-being is just not going to help you in that situation making sure we do that so there's your 150 and your 75 those are your recommendations um three to five days per week if possible you know with that combination so we're always trying to make sure we get 
that much or more, okay? Now you can see the difference there, moderate intensity is more about that brisk walking, it can be brisk rowing, you know, jogging, like goes into vigorous. So you can see where, you know, moderate is, you know, more of like, you know, going out and going for a walk around the neighborhood, where vigorous is gonna be a little bit more of that step up in that intensity. So, you know, guideline purposes with intensity, you know, intensity we were talking about the level of demand placed in the body. So moderate exercise, is like it says here, it represents an intensity range is enough of a demand to increase the heart and, and your breathing rate that doesn't cause exhaustion, but can also be, um, you know, anything above that, okay? So how we typically go by that, there are a bunch of different ways. VO2 max, which you can test for. You can do a percentage of your max heart rate. You can do a percentage of your heart rate reserve, METs, or our RPE and the talk testing. So we're going to go through now VO2, before we go through them all, understand that VO2 max is truly your gold standard in terms of that measurement component, okay? Now, if you want to get a true VO2 max, understand that you're probably going to have to be hooked up to a gas exchange, um, you know, metabolic kind of cart that you would have to, you know, the, if you've ever seen people running with those on, they have like the mask that's put on their face and they have like the big, you know, the, the strap um, from behind on it so that it's all there. And so that what that's doing is it's taking, it's giving you oxygen in, you're breathing CO2 out and it's analyzing the in and out of those. Gives you a true VO2 max, gives you a resting metabolic rate. There's a lot of things that come with it, but again, it's more expensive equipment that you're typically not gonna find at a traditional gym, you'll more than likely try to find those things with like, you know, either private studios, personal individuals who have that, and then research settings. So with max heart rate, it's, you know, it used to be, and I'll kind of, you know, one of the things that it used to be was this right here. Um, and we used to have this 220 minus your age. All right, now 220 minus your age was always the standard, but there really isn't any scientific backing for it, okay? So we went to this new thing called the Tanaka. Well, it's not really new, but it, you know, a newer version of what's called the Tanaka equation. And if you look, it's 208 minus 0.7 minus your age, or excuse me, times your age. I don't know why that was there. This, this should not have been that. So let's go ahead and right here, X. This would be two, so let's go back to that. So it's right on point. So 0.7 times your age. So if you're 20 years old, 0.7, all right, times that is gonna be uh, 14, 208 minus 14. If we do some mental math, there is 194. So you can see there that, you know, a 194 is a little bit different if you than if it was 220 minus your age, which would be 20, it would be 200. So a little bit different there, but again, take it into the heart rate, you're taking the heart rate or the, excuse me, taking your age into the equation. That's a little bit different in terms of, you know, uh, getting a little bit more of an accurate number because you have some sort of parameter to go by. Now, the one that I think is more acceptable in this, you know, in this condition is the, or what we call the Carvonin, the Carvonin method, which is if you look down here in this region, let me see if I can highlight it for you here. So in this region right here, okay, that's what we're looking for. Heart rate max minus your heart rate resting times your desired intensity and then add the heart rate resting back in or your resting heart rate. So again, if we say heart rate max, you know, that's that 220 minus your age minus your resting, okay? So just say again, you're 20 years old and you have a 60, you know, a 60 on the, um, resting heart rate. So you go 220 minus your age. So let's just map this out so we can kind of have a better idea. If we come down here for, oh, never mind. I'm sorry. If we go to the next slide, that's right. That's where we are. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see, you know, two, you know, 208 minus 0.7 times 25 years, you know, 25 years old is a 191 heart rate. Okay. Taking all of this stuff up here into equation, into consideration. So you got 191 minus a 50, right down here, 50 beats per minute, equals 141. Now that's truly, at that point, that's really your heart rate reserve, you know, if you wanna talk about what it exactly is. So 141 times 85% that you wanna work at gives you 120 and then add your 50 
resting heart rate back in gives you 170. So if you're using the heart rate reserve method, this person here is working at a 170 and you're taking into effect a physiological component, meaning that you're taking into account a resting heart rate. Okay, so that's very important to make sure you know how to do this, especially for your testing. Um, make sure you practice, you know, practice, uh, you know, your own equations for different people because that would make it a lot easier for when you come to your NASM test that you are physically able to do that with a pencil and paper, okay? Because usually I don't believe if you're doing it in a testing center, they don't give you a, I think they don't give you a calculator, but just in case. All right, so um, kind of go back really quick. Metabolic equivalent, understand that one met, it, so at rest, one met is 3.5 milliliters of oxygen consumed per kilogram of body weight per minute. That's resting. That's what we would call your resting VO2 max is 3.5 milliliters per kilogram per minute. Now that is an equivalent to one, which means if you're working at a one, that's truly rest. All right, now if you look down at the bottom, if you're working at a value of four, that's usually a slow paced jog, which is you know not too bad, okay? So, um, you know, you, you know, just trying to see, you know, require, you know, so what we're saying there with an equivalent is that if you're working at one rest and you're jogging at a four met, that means you go four times 3.5, which is 14, 14 milliliters of oxygen per, you know, 14 milliliters of oxygen per kilogram per minute. And that's a low end movement. So not too bad, but understand that it's four times harder in that situation. So the other method that we, before the talk that we get into is the rating of perceived exertion. Now here you can look and you can see on the right hand and the left, you know, the right hand side, the two models. Now RPE scale six to 20, you know, that revert, revolves and reverts to a six meaning 60, a 20 meaning a 200 on your physical um, heart rate. That's, but it's a six to 20 scale. But understand here, you know, very hard is a 17. That means you'll be working at a one, a 170 beats per minute heart rate. You know, so that's a pretty, pretty intense type of movement. Okay, so you know that's the true RPE. Now you have a modified RPE, which is a zero to ten or a one to ten, right? Zero meaning you're not doing anything, and a ten meaning like all out effort that's very very challenging on your system, where you would basically be almost keeling over and dying. All right, so. We, we look for those types of things there, um, you know, in terms of how to, but it's a, it's a subjective method. It's a way that we look at it and say, okay, this is what we have. Okay. And it's like, okay, on a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling? If they say an eight, oh, then that means you're working out pretty hard. Okay. So, you know, in talking wise and talking land, we've kind of talked about VT one and we talked about VT two. Okay, but a talk test basically means that if a person can talk to you, they're still revolving around a VT1, ventilatory threshold one, all right? So if they can speak comfortably, that means that they're not stressed on their body and they're able to continue on. Once they can no longer sustain a normal conversation with you, like a constant conversation, that is where they ultimately go to VT2, okay? So, and that, that would be where we would step up in that situation. Okay, so VT1 just can talk, VT2 meaning that, you know, it's, you know, a little bit more challenging. So therefore, it's not as, as tough on this, you know, it's more challenging on the system, excuse me. So here, if we look, there's everything in a nutshell. There's everything that we just talked about in one chart, how to figure it out. So, you know, again, something that's going to be coming up a lot more often and that's something we're going to be looking for, you know, as you get used to working with your cardio base. Now, again, typically you're going to probably be more in the, you know, max heart rate, heart rate reserve, ratings of perceived exertion and talk testing more so than anything else. Okay. So what is, you know, that's your intensity. That's how we determine your intensity and how hard you're going to be working. Now time, we said we want to be about 150. Uh, 150 minutes of moderate, about 75 minutes of vigorous or a combination of both throughout the week. All right. And so that we can come into play with, you know, what is it that we want to give our people now? Typically, you know, again, the, I think the ACSM, I know this is a little bit different, but just for, 
you know, kind of reference standpoint, the ACSM recommends about 300, 300 minutes per week to avoid weight regain. So you can see where you are getting, you know, a little bit less than half on the spectrum throughout for a healthy individual. Okay. So 150 for moderate, 75 for vigorous, or a combination of both. Now the type, it could be anything you want it to be um, in terms of that movement capacity. But for our sake here, you know, typical standpoint, um, jogging, all right, walking, anything on cardio equipment, so your elliptical bases, all right, it could be uh, the rope climber, or no, they, no, not the rope climber, the stair stepper, it could be the uh, ladder, that's what I was talking about, the Jacob's ladder, right, swimming, cycling, any of those. And also you can do interval training, which, you know, again, on and off, on and off, on and off, depending upon your work to rest ratio. So here, if you look, one to one means that if you are resting, all right, if you're resting for, if you're, excuse me, if you're working for 30 seconds, all right, that means a one to one ratio would be one, one session would be 30 seconds of work, one to one would be 30 seconds of rest. Now, there you see a range from one to one to one to one to five. Now, one to five would be for every 30, you know, just say you go 30 seconds, you would go 150 seconds. So about 200, uh, about two and a half minutes of, about two and a half minutes of, uh, of rest. So that would typically mean that if you're getting more rest in that situation, you would be working on, um, you know, it would be a little bit more intense. So therefore you need a little bit more rest so you can get back to it. So high intensity interval training, same premise, you know, but again, max effort versus an interval, which is, you know, that could be also, excuse me. So if we go back to that really quick too, you know, that could be anything for distance that could, you know, that could be for time. So it just, you know, whereas high interval inter is a little bit, that is where we're not going to get to a steady rate during those times. So it's very, very challenging in that situation. All right. So this one here again, you know, can you're spending less time during that, you know, but you're getting more bang for your buck in those moments. Okay. Tabata training, that's your standard 2010. Okay. 20 seconds on 10 seconds off. And you're using some sort of exercise base for that. Now, typically we want to do something a little bit more traditional cardio than anything else. Fartlek training, basically you're, you're kind of moving in and out of low, moderate, and high intensity efforts, you know, based on how you feel. That's kind of how that works. Okay. So fartlek training really, you know, it's more about function of your feelings. So it's like, okay, I'm going to start slow, build to moderate, build to high intensity, cut back down to moderate, come back to high, go down to low, go to high. You know, so you can always ebb and flow the way you want to. Okay. So, and then other parts of the guidelines here, enjoyment, you know, just making sure you give somebody something they want. You know, it's, it's, you know, for me, I'm not a huge cardio buff, but other people are, and I don't, you know, I would never take away that from them, but, you know, make it something that they enjoy. I don't mind doing interval stuff. So I, you know, for me, that's where I would try to find my, you know, my sort of realm. Other people might like five mile runs and, and the like, you know, so you, you can see where you want to get the person what they need. Volume wise, again, we said 150 to, you know, to 75 weight loss benefits. That's a little bit different than what I was saying about weight regain, but weight loss benefits are, you know, 250 minutes or greater. So again, trying to lose weight, you got to put more time and effort in. You want to not gain the weight that you lost back. You got to put more time and effort into it. All right. And then progression, you know, we're, we're, we're overloading correctly. We're, you know, we're giving people 10% per week is what we want to look for. Okay. So that's the main thing there is that, you know, you want to gradually increase and that's a rule of thumb, 10% volume increase testing question, most likely going to find on both NASM's test and in class. So again, there's your 150. Um, if you exceed 300 minutes per week, you know, um, or 150 minutes a week for vigorous, um, you know, you'll, you'll get more benefits from it. So just understand that, like we said, the more you put in, the more you're going to get from it, you know, but again, too, at what point do you cut your losses and say, okay, there's no need for this person to go any more than that unless they're like an athlete. Okay. So there's your, you know, again, just like most things, you know, you got your, your warm up, your conditioning and your cool down. All right. So that's the key there is that you're going to still do it just like you would a resistance training model, like you would do anything else. All right. So, 
again, you know, just want to make sure you meet the needs. You you pay attention to what their needs are, what their goals are, where they assess that to start them at and then the right place. OK, and that's going to carry them through to avoid any sort of health risk factors or anything like that. So, again, there's your general warm up, you know, that you want to talk about a general warm up, meaning just kind of getting normal movement in your specific warm up is something where you are going to really sit there and focus on, um, you know, are you using a rower? So if you're using a rower, then we want to make sure that we not only take care of our legs, but we take care of our back, our upper back. You know, so there's a lot of things that we have to do with rowing because upper body and lower body combo. Okay. So again, five to 10 minutes. Okay. That's the key. Five to 10 minutes of a, a warm up is all you would need. Low, low to moderate intensity. All right. Um, that's that. That's the critical component for that. So again, if you have someone who's new, someone who might have some medical problems, you know, somebody who, um, you know, really need needs just a little bit more attention, then you can obviously extend that if you need to. Um, you know, again, what do we, you know, with with what we're trying to achieve, we want to explain the benefits, why we're doing it, make sure we give them some flexibility stuff. All right, that's going to be the critical component for their warm up. So again, w- you know, we've talked about. I, I say again for this sake, I say that because you look at the. This is the flexibility component of it. Self myofascial release. We talked about static stretching. We talked about now getting that cardio warm up in five to ten minutes, and we could be ready to go for a traditional warm up. And then you go from there to what you want to give them for their true, you know, true cardio training session. Benefit wise, there's so many of them. We didn't, you know, again, with that conditioning phase, there's so many benefits that come with it from, you know, anything from, you know, cholesterol reduction to lowered resting heart rates to, you know, just the ability to sleep better. So there's so many things that come from that in terms of benefits. Now, the cool down phase, again, um, you know, we've talked a little bit about cool downs previously, but, you know, the main thing here is to get the resting heart, you know, to get the heart back down to a, um, not resting, but close to resting heart rate and breathing rate. Get um, the body temperature cooled. Get muscles to be able to relax and try to get back to resting lengths. Prevent blood from pooling within muscles, meaning that, you know, you want to take, you know, by having a cool down, you're going to take the blood that was pooled in maybe the legs from a run. By doing a cool down, you're going to redistribute the blood better from the lower extremities to wherever, you know, to back to the brain, back to the the intestines, you know, back to the stomach so that things can start working back to normal. And then there's your restore, your restoration of your physiological system back to baseline as close to possible, you know, but again, your, your cool down should be just like your warm up where it's five to 10 minutes. So here is, you know, a, a model of that. There's your five to 10 minutes of general cool down. You know, there's, there's this self myofascial release and then the static stretching. But if you notice, they did put a little bit of static stretching before this here. Now, that's NASM's recommendation. It can be, you know, you can use dynamic in that situation as well. So we're going to go over the zones of the stage training that we're going to we're going to provide you. NASM works within they have what's called stage training that has zones that you want to be within. And each one has a specific way that you want to work with a person. All right. And that works around what we call the principle of specificity of being specific to what each person's trying to achieve. All right. We want to give the adaptation for the achievement of the person. So if they want intervals, we're not going to be in zone one or zone two, you know, etc. So stage one, all right. And if you look there, stage one has four zones and those are your heart rate zones. Stage one is for new people. It's really going to be your ventilatory threshold or below, all right? And it's really more about getting them to build an aerobic base and a better fitness level so that you can, you know, start improving from there. If you look, it says 30-minute workout, staying in that low, light, moderate VT1 style. So, again, this, this person could most likely spend time here and be able to talk to you the whole time, okay? Stage two, on the other hand, now we're starting to see that we're going through a little bit of intervals. We're going to be going from zone one to zone two, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. All right. Now, this is for intermediate fitness levels. 
starting with that warm up, getting into one minute at zone two. So again, the VT1, because we've talked about it, VT1 is more about can you talk to them, okay? So you're going to be working just above VT1. So their breathing and their talking is going to be a little bit labored, but not too difficult. So they go one minute there, three minutes down to recovery, one minute, three minutes for as long as they need to go. Okay, but you're always progressing from stage one to this stage two. Now, the difference here is stage two actually has a little bit of what we would call a steady state. This is a steady state base, you know, meaning that you're going to go for the same consistency the whole time. So you're going to go 30 minutes trying to stay low and slow, whereas stage two, there's also, like we said here, there's an, there's an interval base. Stage two also has what we would say is a, another steady state aerobic where you're going to be staying in that zone two, which is, again, a little bit labored on the talking if it was ventilatory threshold one. But understand that the heart rate is not going to be exaggerated and it's not going to be too high where they can't talk to you. Stage three, on the other hand, now we're starting to get up into those higher zones, zone three of your training. So if you look, again, there's your warm up. They'll spend one minute in VT1, a little bit more aggressive in VT1, and then you'll get into VT2 as you start getting into zone three, back down for one minute, back up, and you keep going again for as, as long as your predetermined amount is. All right, and then you head into your cool down. So you're always intervaling between your VT1 and VT2. Can you talk to me? Your talking becomes labored. All right, and that's a good way to kind of talk about that. Stage four, because if you saw, again, stage three, stage four, much more. This is really for advanced individuals, but you're looking here, you're definitely going between, you know, for stages one through four, you know, you're still progressing through VT1 to VT2. But here you can see that you're going all out effort. Warm up, one minute through uh, zone two, one minute through zone three, and then you're going to go 10 seconds of hard, come back down to zone one. 10 seconds of hard, come back down, to, back down to zone one. All right, so this one here is a little bit more of that true interval base. So a little bit more intensity, a little bit more high, you know, higher intensity, higher quality movement. And then stage five, there's no, um, there's no chart for this, but understand that stage five is more truly higher level more athletic based types of movements okay so here we're we can't really monitor in in this in, in in this manner what we need to do here is be a little bit more aware of you know wearing a mon you know wearing a um a wearable a heart rate monitor a heart rate monitoring system so that you can be able to adjust them for what they're doing so that we can see how hard they're working and back them off as needed okay and that's really the name of the game is this is more about where we have built them up so much that now we got to be able to perform specific tasks and drills that will get them to be able to work on their true conditioning at that point. Okay, more higher intensity, more more skill, more game, more game like situ situations. All right. So those are the those are the zones zones one through four. Those are the stages one through five. So make sure that you don't mix up what your zones and your stages are. So just remember, stage is where you are in terms of your intensity levels. The zones are the intensity levels that you'd be working at. Okay. And then lastly, some things to think about for postural considerations. You know, making sure that someone is running correctly is a very challenging thing. So we, we always want to make sure that even during their assessment time that they're, you're working with them, we want to make sure we're still paying attention to these things. Do they have a forward head or a rounded shoulder set? Um, do they have like a hip that is more anteriorly tilted that you can see where it would almost be like dumping out the pail? And then, you know, uh, are they, you know, are you seeing their, their knees actually bowing in, you know, on a rower, on an elliptical, on a bike, on a, even on a run? And all of those, if you see the, the knees bowing in, understand that you're also going to have, that's the internal rotation of the knee. And it's also the pronated feet with that, with the eversion. And all of those things are a problem that will cause injury later on down the road, okay? So we want to be aware of that. We have to pay attention to that. And we want to make sure that that does not come back to bite us or our people that we're working with, okay? So postural considerations are definitely something to think about. 
So cardio again, very, very easy to implement, very hard, very also easy to mess up. So staying within those parameters will definitely make the biggest difference possible. All right. So please make sure that you focus in on this, know your stages, know your zones, know what the benefits are, and we can go from there. So again, chapter 15 is that second stage. Flexibility was chapter 14. Cardio is chapter 15. And then we're going to move into core for chapter 16. So again, thanks for listening and hope to hear from you soon.